In this week's episode, I'm talking to Johnny Peterson in Ireland about how he got into sourcing, what resources he used to learn, and how to source in Denmark. This is episode 41 of the Sourcing Challenge show, and I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. I started off by asking Johnny how he got started in sourcing. Um, so I got started at sourcing actually for ISEC, um, which is one of these, actually I think it's the most massive student organization in the world, like they're pretty much everywhere. Um, so I was, I just started my master's and probably like everyone was kind of like, okay, what do I want to do? I don't really know. Like I'm studying like business administration, which is everything like, like, okay, I don't know what I like. Um, so I joined ISEC to sort of find out what I really liked as well. Uh, and I joined the, the HR talent acquisition team as, as, as they call it, talent management, I think. Um, and, and there I, I, I started recruiting actually. So it was more like university recruitment. Um, so the whole ISIC thing worked like you had some clients that needed interns. Um, we were in Denmark, Denmark needed IT. So we were recruiting and sourcing IT interns from everywhere. So everywhere from Egypt to the US, to Russia, to Poland, to Utah and so on. Um, and recruit a bit of internal as well. So some of our marketing, some of our sales people, stuff like that. That's where I actually started sourcing. Um, and it fitted me perfectly, like absolutely loved it after like even up two, three weeks. Um, it was just like, if you're like an outgoing, like for me, I was an outgoing person. I love talking to people, love being on the phone. And the feeling that you did something like amazing for another person, especially when I have a guy that maybe comes from a difficult situation in Mexico, um, no really jobs, anything like that. You know, he gets to Denmark and he's like absolutely amazed and has this amazing job. Um, most of our interns got permanent jobs afterwards because they were doing so well compared to the Danish interns they had. And uh, simply because they were so grateful to actually get to Denmark and to get that opportunity. Um, so that's where I first got my really sort of passion for recruitment, like this huge difference you do in both the businesses. Because right, you're finding them someone who's going to make their company, their business so much better, but also you're doing someone this, not favor, like it's finding a job for them, right? But, but like they, they feel so grateful if it's really a fit, and if it's really a career opportunity for them. It's, it's something that they really, really appreciate. Um, and I sort of got hooked on that feeling, <laughs> I, I suppose. Um, and from that moment, I knew that I wanted to be in recruitment. So I sort of changed from study towards HR and recruitment, towards my master's. Um, I stayed in ISIG and recruited for nearly two years. Um, so that was like, yeah, at, at that moment, I just went full, <laughs> full on into recruitment. So that's, that's how I got started. And how did you, uh, how did you end up in Dublin? Um, so I finished my master's um, and to be honest, the job market in Denmark was so boring. <laughs> Everybody gets surprised when, when they hear it, but like Denmark is just consistent of small, medium companies that have the same employees staying there 10, 15 years doing the same thing. Um, that was not for me. <laughs> so I moved to Dublin. Um, I had a friend actually uh, that moved to Dublin um, and he told me about, you know, all these big companies is there and, and this insane career growth you can have in Dublin. Um, so I decided to move um, just to sort of start my career after my master's degree and, and sort of, you know, just get started straight away. Um, I actually started in sales <laughs> when I moved to Dublin. Um, and the reason for it was that I still felt a bit nervous over the phone when I did sales calls, for example. It can be like perfectly fine, but most people like to hear if you have an opportunity or a job for them. Hmm. I don't find that nerve wracking as doing, you know, calling companies and, and doing that type of selling. Um, so I decided to take a sales job in Smartbox, um, which is everywhere. Um, and just, you know, did hardcore cold calling sales and stuff like that for nine months. After nine months, I was like, yeah, it doesn't touch me anymore. Like 50 calls a day, everything is good. I can handle angry people <laughs> over the phone or annoyed people. Um, and then after, after, after that, uh, I went into to Manpower, uh, back into recruitment here in Dublin. Um, just did the, not the typical agency recruitment, actually, I've been super, super lucky in that terms. So I started working on like the strategic team. Um, 
and basically what the strategic team does is we have like these like specific contracts for companies that only use us. So, so like we only use us and sort of like supporting their recruitment team. So I would have 10, 12 teams within like some of the big like IT companies, HP, DXC, Microsoft, that used me like a extra resource. So if they have too many roles, they would just call me and be like, okay, Johnny, we just need your help on these couple of roles. Um, so it was agency, but I had a lot more contact with the hiring managers, uh, with the team there. I met the hiring managers. I was sitting there at, at their office once in a while. Um, so it's a lot like, like the close relationship from, from the get-go. Um, so I worked there for around a year. And then I met, uh, actually, I met a person from Facebook at the DPI event here in Dublin, <laughs> completely random. Um, and she was talking about Facebook, um, you know, they make this data center in Ulms in Denmark. It's like, oh, I'm from there. Like, oh yeah, we look for engineers. Oh yeah, I did, I guess I did something around like how to attract engineers during my master's degree. And then basically she was like, okay, do you want a job? <laughs> well, we can have a chat. And the next day I chatted with, uh, with the hiring manager. Three days later, I was doing the interviews. And I think five days later, I had, to <laughs> I had a job on Facebook. Uh, and that's, that's where I sit now. Uh, so I sit at Facebook and do sort of data center recruitment. And I mean, in terms of kind of learning and uh, like you, you learn a lot by doing obviously in Isaac, but then coming to manpower and Facebook, where, where have you kind of gone to learn or who did you learn from? Like, where did you pick up knowledge? Yeah, I, I love this part because um, in Isaac, you know, as you know, it's, it's, you don't have an established process. Um, so you have to learn everything from yourself. Um, and you can't go and complain, oh, I don't get enough training for my company and I don't get these costs, I don't get paid this and that. Um, so I was already in the mindset that you can literally find everything. Like if any knowledge you can find on the internet if you know where, where to look. Um, so in my Isaac days where, where I started, um, because I was studying, I went to actually articles, like scientific articles, <laughs> very boring and very, very dry. Um, but I started up with these like articles that did studies on what attracts people, right? What, what actually works, what's important, is it, is it only the salary? Is it the is it the culture? Is it the flexibility and stuff like that? Um, so that's where I started. Then when I moved to, to manpower, obviously it got a bit more hardcore <laughs> in terms of in terms of recruitment. And I was super lucky. So I actually got the full um, like pass to to social talent. Um, so that was my learning platform in the beginning. Uh, and to be honest, I really really liked it. Uh, I know a lot of people have different opinions about it, how relevant it is. But like, if, if you start and, and, and you want to build some of the basic knowledge up, I think it's, for me, it's really, really good. Um, and I took my sweet time going through it as well. I took six months um, and I was writing down everything uh, <laughs> for learning. What, what I learned is that if you don't write it down, you forget it. That's, that's just like my, my, my basic rule. Um, just write everything down and you think you remember it and you really don't. And then you get some knowledge you don't have to use now, but you have to use in two months, and then you forget it. Um, so I actually have like a, a, a <laughs> Word document over 300 pages long with notes from everything <laughs> from social talent uh, in the beginning uh, and from, from articles, from communities, uh, from podcasts. Um, so I started with social talent, um, started to get into the community, actually started to talk with Tris. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my girlfriend, I got a job at Indeed, and Tris was her mentor. So I just sort of got into the community through him, actually. Um, starting to go into social talent meetups. So they have these meetups, I think it's once every third week, uh, where get, like, they do some like, presentations and stuff like that. Get to start meeting a lot of people from the community. Um, people start to point in the right directions, right? Um, <laughs> like if you want the knowledge, it's out there. Like you make one post and 50 people tell you where to go. Um, so I, I think my main source in the beginning was social talent, yeah. And then now it's just LinkedIn following the right people, reading their articles. Uh, I follow um, a lot of podcasts actually, but it's two or three that I really, really like. Um, and then I love Hong Lee's sort of, like brain food that he does. It's absolutely brilliant because 
it saves me the time to scour everything because there's so much information. That's the thing. Um, and then, you know, following your YouTube channel, <laughs> following some, some other YouTube channels, um, LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups, more than ever now, Facebook groups, like LinkedIn groups kind of died. Like I used it in the beginning and basically just got spammed by get this job or get this product. Yeah. Um, what I found is that I had a lot of colleagues that was like, yeah, I don't get these courses. I don't know. I don't know what this is. I don't know how to do that. Like, if you're willing to use the community, like you have absolutely no excuse for, for not learning and being good. Like you have all the information there. You don't have to pay one single euro for it. <laughs> no, it's always, it's always somebody that knows. Like ask the question and somebody's going to know or point you in the right, right direction. That's, that's, that's the thing. Uh, and especially for me, because I'm, I'm still, compared to a lot of people, I'm still rather new in recruitment. Um, and I kind of took charge of my own development, just shot through the, through the learning curve, because you don't have to wait for your manager or your mentor or anyone like that to get back to you. Like you have a whole community out there um, and they're all willing to help. So if you really want to go in and, and you know, smash your targets and show that you're really good in being creative, you don't have to start from all scratch. Like 99% of the time, somebody else thought about it. Yeah. Take what he did. It sounds maybe a bit bad, but copy, take what he did and then try and make it better and in the terms of that fits your situation. And in that way, you know, you, you come with these, a lot of like, creative ideas, Boolean strings, outreaches methods, a lot faster than if you have to start thinking from scratch. Um, so that's how I sort of learned and, and continue to learning as well. Okay. So with the kind of, well, the bit of DBR and the, the, the social talent community in Dublin, what's the, what's the kind of greater community look like? Is it very kind of close knit or is it, is it around the kind of social talent or a, a bit more DBR lately as well? Or how does the community kind of look? Like for, for me, like how the community looks. Yeah. What's the kind of size of it in Dublin or. Yeah. Like it's not that huge. Well, I think what, what, what surprised me the most is how, how little people are actually using this and how many recruits are not using this, right? So in social talent meetups, I think we would be around between 40 and 50. Like that's, that's a typical DBR, we would be 8 to 12, 13. Um, like, the, like some of the other events, I think usually the, the amount of recruiters is always around the 50, 60, 70 mark. Um, that's a typical amount of people that I see actually showing up to different events. It could also be like this source com we had at, at mm. LinkedIn as well. I think that was the amount of people as well. Yeah. Uh, I went to a few events at LinkedIn as well, same amount of people. Um, so I think, I think that's, I think that the community could be a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. There's so many recruiters in Dublin, like the market is insane. <laughs> um, so what I saw at least is that you can instantly get a competitive edge if you actually do this, if you're active. I had colleagues like, how did you get this person from, where did you get this Danish person? And, and when you're finding them, it's like, I'm going to events. Like I, I, I'm, I'm going places. I'm not just sitting and, and, and doing the same sourcing all over again. I'm actually being a bit active on, on where the people are, like going to German, learn how to speak German events with Germans. Be like, yeah, I want to learn to speak German. Also do want a job. <laughs> So just being being a bit different, actually using the community. Yeah, I think that's that's about the size as well. For you, having recruited uh, technical people in Dublin and kind of all over Europe, and then now having to to look at them in Denmark, what's the big kind of difference? Like, yeah, I haven't recruited in Denmark in many many years, and people are always like, "What's it like recruiting in Denmark?" It's like, I wouldn't know anymore because it was still in the bloody newspaper when I did it. There's definitely some specific challenges of, of Denmark. It's, it's fun because I feel Denmark is kind of like a lot like slower and not as used to recruiting and headhunting as you know, like Dublin, London, like everybody have LinkedIn profiles. Everybody knows how to write a LinkedIn profile. Danish people, the most part, don't know how to not know how to write a LinkedIn profile. So your bullying strings have to be completely different. Because if you just make it a little bit too long, you're not going to find them. You have to learn, you have to go in a lot more into the companies, mm -hmm. finding out what people do in those positions and then find them. Because you can't do a skill-based search because most likely they just have the job. That's it. 
Um, so that was the main difference for me. So I think it was my most feral market map I've ever made was of Denmark because of this. Like all the job titles, I knew like, okay, the Danish government has this data center with this many people, these different types of positions. Uh, if a person has that type of position or work with that person, okay, he should have worked with X, Y, and Z, and therefore I can use him. <laughs> um, I think that was, that was one of the main differences. Um, and also, like in Denmark, you have a lot of like small and medium-sized companies. So for me, working where I do in, in, in Facebook, um, I have the wow effect still, um, because Facebook is pretty much the only really, really big company in Denmark at the moment. Google is, is coming in with a data center, Apple is coming in now. But otherwise, the biggest companies we have is Danfoss. Nobody knows what Danfoss is. <laughs> well, Danish. Yeah. I don't know what Lego is, but like you, you have maybe like four or five really, really big companies and that's it. Um, so that's, that's, that's the main challenge, but also make it easier that you come from a big, from a big company, sort of have that wow effect and people get back to you just for curiosity. Like your email would just be around curiosity. Just be like, these are technical people. Like they like to know the new technologies, what's happening and stuff like that. So I tend to do the email around just, you know, or oh, have you heard X, Y, and Z? What do you think about that? And then like, oh yeah, it sounds really cool. I do want to have a chat. That's usually the way in uh, on, on the Danish market I found. And what's something exciting or challenging that you're working on now? I'm working on a very, very challenging role. <laughs> In, in Sweden, so we have a data center in Luleå. But for, for you who doesn't know where Luleå is, it's eight hours north of Stockholm. Uh, and the normal response I get from Swedish people when I ask if you want to move there is just, no, I'm not going to move to Luleå. <laughs> <laughs> um, on top of that, uh, the volume recruiting for there is insanely specific. Like, it's, it's, it's a role that you only have if you have a certain scale of, of, of data center. It's like a capacity planning. So it's literally only planning the capacity of your servers. Um, and again, nobody really writes that on the CV. Oh, I'm a capacity planner. No, again, you have to write through the, like, through the profile and, and be like, okay, if you worked on that, most likely you touch capacity planning. Um, and the challenge as well is that it's such a niche, but it needs from one that has enough knowledge in this niche that maybe did 20% of his job. Not 100%, but now he's going to go do 100%. And we are interviewing him as he has to have the best knowledge of 100%. Um, because this role is global as well. So it's capacity planning for all the data centers across Europe. So it's like super senior, like senior management position, super niche, in a really, really remote location where they ski in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> if you Google it, uh, I had candidates doing it, right? So, so what do you do? Okay, Lulia, you Google it. The first thing you see in Google Maps is people skiing in the streets and you go like, what, <laughs> what is this? Um, no, so that's a huge challenge. Um, the role itself is also completely new for Facebook, meaning that like Facebook as a company have never hired for this role before. When you have a role, it's completely new for the business, completely new in, in, in sort of concept and only really works if you're a specific scale. Like, it's, it's a huge challenge, but it's also really, really interesting because um, you have to use a lot of time on just talking with the hiring manager, talking with, with, with your engineers, actually working there, working somewhat on, on, on capacity planning, on, on that specific niche, and, and sort of find out what do we actually need and what type of person would actually be good, um, what type of, like, technologies have, have, have they touched. Um, and we had to change the, the entire recruitment structure as well. As maybe a lot of people know, like getting into Facebook is like six interviews. Uh, so it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy amount of time. Also for the candidate side, right? So if you have the wrong candidate and his skills doesn't match, he's going to have a shitty time doing six interviews. And he's going to feel very discouraged and really annoyed that you wasted his time because it's not only one day, you know, it's, it's six interviews. It's, it's a process of like three months. Um, so the, the challenge is of getting the profile right, actually more than finding the person, because if you have the profile, yeah. then you can find the right person, right? Like then it's just about finding him, at least finding someone who has transferable skills. Um, 
So yeah, that's that's one of my <laughs> most challenging roles uh, I ever worked on, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, if uh, if people want to keep in contact with you and and yeah, see what you keep working on, how can they best do that? Um, so I'm mostly active on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, my Facebook is sort of a weird mix of personal and work, um, but that's the type of style I like. I keep it very personal and close, uh, also in recruitment. So for me, having Facebook where people can see personal pictures of me as well, for me helps my own, like the way I, I reach out to people because like, oh, it's just a person and he's really nice. And look, he likes cat pictures. Um, <laughs> So, so on, on, on Facebook, I am in a lot of the communities and on, on LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah, I, I have a very smiley picture of my face, really, really close up. <laughs> so you can, so hopefully you can recognize me. Well, thank you very much for, uh, yeah, for being on the show and having time for me. Absolutely. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoy your show. It's, it's really interesting to hear, you know, other people's stories as well. Happy to share.